welcome to the webinar. My name is Anne Moyer Brown and I'm your hostess. Our guest today describes herself as a data nerd. For the rest of us, she is a data visualization and design expert. Through her workshops and keynote deliveries, she has trained many persons and has various clients. These clients include Fortune 500 companies like MasterCard and Facebook, and mission-aligned clients like the United Nations, the Boys and Girls Club, and the Alaska Native Trial Health Consortium. She has published three books and has a popular blog on data visualization. She conducts online data visualization classes through the DataVis Academy and the Graph Guides program. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephanie Evergreen. Thank you so much, Anne. It's really nice to be here with you. Yes, thank you so much for agreeing to share your time and your expertise with us today. So just for participants joining in, oh, I like I see the chat is already coming alive. Thank you guys for already <laughs> being interactive there. If you could just continue to state where you're from so we have an idea of the global representation. So we have around 60 minutes today. And although Stephanie and I will be having a conversation, feel free to just put your questions throughout. Do not leave them to the end. Throughout our conversation, just type your questions and we'll try to get through as much of them as possible. So enough talk, let's get straight down to business. Stephanie, what is data visualization? Oh, the most basic question with the hardest answer. Um, I think the best, the, the probably the most honest way to talk about data visualization is to say that it is some graphical representation based in some kind of data that leaves the umbrella very, very wide open. We could be talking about quantitative data. We could be talking about qualitative data. Data visualization can be something like a chart. It could be something like a diagram. I mean, I think that the the umbrella is wide. Okay, indeed. And because my background is in evaluation, I, I don't consider myself as having any design experience or expertise. However, in my line of work, I've had to present data, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for data visualization, is it that you have to be schooled particularly? Is there a school that you go to learn data visualization? Do you have to have a design background, graphic background? Who is it for? I, yeah, you know, I always think those things can help, but they're certainly not required. I mean, back when I first got interested, my background also being evaluation, uh, when I first got interested in data visualization, there wasn't a school, like there were no classes in this. I kind of had to make it up myself as I went along. So. I'm a really big advocate in do-it-yourself data visualization and design. I think the internet is full of resources. Yours are great, Anne, as a as one example. Um, there's so much out there that you can self-study. I mean, there are, I believe, entire degree programs now in data visualization, particularly in like journalism. I feel like that's a field where they have really started to focus on using data to tell a story formally. Um, I think you'll see classes or certificates offered in other places, but I always just say, use what you've got. You know, if you um, don't have the funds to get yourself into a degree program, you can surely just find some easy courses online to take or blog posts. I mean, there's so much out there that's free if you just put the time in. Okay, well, since you spoke about that, Maybe for persons listening, they'll be interested to know. I know you have published books on the subject matter, but outside of your books, what would be like a data visualization Bible that newbies could buy to mm -hmm. teach themselves a bit? So I feel like some of the more classic books in this area would be um, Edward Tufte, he who's written for, um, or anything by Stephen Few. He writes about very practical data visualization. He focuses a lot on dashboards as well. Those are two authors that are sort of like elders in the data viz field who have these books that have established some foundations for us. So I always find that they're good introductions. They're good to get people excited, but they don't ever tell you how to do it. And they don't 
give you a lot of research to support why they're telling you what they're telling you. And so it can feel a bit like it, um, it's a good example, it's inspiration, but I wouldn't want that to be where people end their journey. Um, so I'll put those, oh, thank you. Nick put those um, names into the chat for us. Edward Tufte and Stephen Few. Yeah, those are two of like the elders in this field. Um, another good author to check out these days is Alberto Cairo and I'll type his name into the chat box for you. Um, he's a newer author, younger, um, more about one of our contemporaries who writes about how we should be using data to tell truthful, accurate stories. So another good one to follow. Um, however, also someone who doesn't really tell you exactly how. They can give you lots of good design and examples, but um, my books are going to be the ones that tell you how you actually push the buttons to make it happen. Yeah, and what's the title of your books? <laughs> so, <laughs> and how can people get them? Two are two that I would recommend, uh, Presenting Data Effectively, which talks not just about your graphs, but about your slideshows, your reports, your, your everything, how to make it all look good. Um, the other one is effective data visualization. And that was that's the one that has step-by-step -step instructions on exactly like what buttons to push inside Excel to make these things happen. There's even a chapter in there on qualitative visualization. That's something that most people don't talk about at all. Um, we have the largest collection of qualitative data viz examples in that book. There's also a sketchbook which gives you templates and things to um, get your get you thinking and to make your life more efficient. Um, but it's less of a how-to. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. And um, oh, someone mentioned I love the book How Charts Lie. <laughs> That's by Alberto Cairo, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, great, great. Now, you went and you wrote all those books. Where did this passion come from? Because it's one thing, like, I like data visualization, but I'm not gonna write a book. Sorry, guys, <laughs> but I'm not gonna write a book. Anymore. So where did this passion and drive and interest come from that you're like, you know what? books yeah you know i question that same thing all the time um where and why i think it's partly because i was blogging about this from very very early on so back when blogging was like a very popular thing to do but i've kept going ever since then. so when you write blogs on any topic you end up generating a lot of content so at some point the publishers approached me and said how about we start developing this into a book so it was easy to do in that regard. And then once you write one, there is an ongoing pressure for the rest of your life to write another one and another one and another one. So sometimes the motivation is less that um, I think of a new good book. It's more other people are saying, it's time to put out a new book. Okay, great, great. I uh, lovely answer, right? And it's clear that you're passionate about the subject matter and just from your practice, what are some of the common mistakes you see people making? I know that's a broad question. It is, but a broad there must question. be one or two that jump at you. Yeah. That, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think that the probably the first, the biggest mistake I see is that people haven't really thought through first what they want to say. Like they don't, they haven't thought through what their insight is or what the meaning is in the data that they are showing. Um, which I, mean, I don't think is really our fault. I think that's how we're trained in school. Academia sort of teaches you that you aren't supposed to have a point, that you're just supposed to put the data out there and the audience is going to look at it and come up with their own points, which once you get out in the real world, you're like, who thought that was a good idea? Like our audiences are actually usually coming to us because they want to learn what we know not because they want to roll up their sleeves and spend all their mental energy digging into our, our data to figure out the point. They want to know what we think the point is. So I think that the, the mistake that we make is that we don't lead our audiences along. We don't tell our story, we just show the data. And I think there's a really big difference there. Telling your story requires you to have spent some time looking at your data and really thinking about it to figure out what those insights are that you want to share. And the other piece of that is the audience that you are sharing it with. I think we often forget who, we don't really even take the time to think about who we are gonna be talking to and what their level of data literacy is, um, whether they're insiders and we can use acronyms and jargon or whether they're outsiders and we have to use very plain language. So I think we um, often just jump to a chart we think is cool or some, some pretty 
make without really considering where our what our story is and who our audience is going to be those two things should really dictate what our chart choices might be which could mean you end up making a really good looking bar chart and it's not some some beautiful piece of art that's going to go on someone's wall um, but if that's what your audience needs and that's what's sufficient for your point then so be it okay so basically if if i can maybe summarize if i interpret it correctly that uh some of the the things then that people could do better is one you need to analyze the data so not just present the data and let people figure out what you mean by mm -hmm. the data and as you say it has a lot to do with how we have been trained like mm -hmm. like me as an evaluator sometimes there's a section about presenting the findings but without bringing the subjectivity into it. So people should be able to analyze the data and draw their conclusions. So that's the first step, analyze the data, tell a story before you put it out there. And secondly, as well, you need to know your audience. This is a big one because I, I find in my field, at least, that a lot of how data is presented and written, it's, it's assumed that it will be a technical audience who understands what you mean. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think that is a very, very salient point to remember. Okay, so mm -hmm. now for practical tips mm -hmm. that, so, because we spoke about some of the issues that we see, people not knowing their audience, not pitching for their audience, and not analyzing the data, but what are some practical tips that you can share to improve data visualization? So I would say off the bat, just never assume the defaults are going to work. Like actually what you should do is assume the defaults will never be good enough. It doesn't even really matter what software you're working in. The defaults will never be enough because the software doesn't know your story. You're always going to have to do something to the default chart that you get to make your story really clear. And the sooner we accept that, that we're gonna have to change the defaults, the better we become at this whole job because it gives us this ability to create more time in our schedule to like plan for the fact that we're going to have to spend time making the graphs um, instead of waiting till the last minute to kind of just like whip it out at you know the day the report is due or something like that. So I think if you just know the defaults will always have to be changed, um, it gives you some room and it's also a way that you can get your branding in there. It's a way that you end up looking more professional um, so you end up selling yourself as much as you're selling your data. Okay. All right. But changing the defaults, this led me now to think, what are some of the data visualization software that you, from your experience, are like, yes, it's good, you know, before so, we get to default to change that. Yeah. 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 So my go-to data visualization tool is Excel. I use Excel <laughs> because I know how, and it can do amazing things. Uh, you just have to know what buttons to push to get to get it there. Um, I also use Tableau, but Tableau is obviously more expensive. Uh, it's a quite hefty investment for many people to have to make, and not everybody's going to have it. So the reason I like to use Excel is that I know that if I email that file to somebody else, chances are they're going to be able to open it and work with it themselves. Um, so I like that. And it doesn't really matter to me whether I'm working with Excel or Tableau, I'm still going to have to change up those defaults. That's just the nature of the beast. You know, if your graph looks like, if someone can look at it and tell what software it was made in, you're not going far enough with adjusting those defaults. So it doesn't really matter if it's Tableau or Excel, you're going to have to change those default fonts. You're going to have to change those default colors. You might even have to change the way the graph looks a little bit um, to make sure that your story is really clear. Oh, Stephanie, I have a confession. Mm. I didn't know. It's, it sounds silly, but it didn't even occur to me that I could change defaults. Is it, is it a straightforward oh. thing to, to like a newbie like me, like for example, in Excel? Yes. Is it that I can go in? I thought those charts were just automatically generated and I can't. Well, like, there's so many, yeah, they are automatically generated, but then you have complete editorial control over how it looks after that. So Excel is going to default to something like Calibri and they're going to have their default color palette. It's that Excel class, all of those things. You just have to know where the menus are to do it. Same thing inside Tableau, you can change all those defaults. It's going to take a minute, especially the first time that you go through it. Um, but that's why I like using those tools. There are plenty of other tools out there as well. There's R, which is 
Um, also, it's open source, so it's free. It's just that you have to know how to code in order to make it happen. And I'm too old. Like, I'm not sure I'm ever going to learn how to code in my entire life. And there's some basic um, graphing that you can do in so many. I mean, there are just so many programs that you can use these days. But the reason that I like Excel and Tableau is because I can kind of break it. Like I can take the default graphic is me and I can make a better graph that it doesn't naturally make, but that tells a better story. And Excel is just really flexible in that way. For example, like Google Sheets, you just cannot break it the way that you can break Excel. You can't break it the way that you can break Tableau. So I like those because then I'm not restricted to the limited set of graphs that they provide me ahead of time. They I can use ones that I know from my experience in my work are just more effective. Okay, so for example, I use SPSS and I use SurveyMonkey, right? And SurveyMonkey generates these charts. Can I change that or would I no. have to? Okay. Yeah, you can't change that, which is why, I mean, they, SurveyMonkey doesn't know your story, they never will. They'll never know what you really need to be saying. So my advice is always to, output that data, pop it into an Excel spreadsheet and make your graph that way or pop it that into Tableau, way. whatever you're most comfortable with, but never use their reports. Their reports are never going to do you the justice that you deserve. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let me try and take some questions now from sure. the audience. Okay. So Louise Manuel Baptista, Baptista asks, what's your opinion about increased use of story maps or spatial information? and how they can improve people to read the charts and info we are showing. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by story maps. So mm -hmm. if you can expound a little bit in the chat box, then maybe I can speak to that. Um, if you're talking about like geographic maps, we do see a lot of that being storytelling about maps. Sure, we see a lot of geographic data presented as maps these days. Um, I mean, I think sometimes it can help, sometimes it doesn't. I think sometimes it gets in the way. Like if you're from that area that's in the map, you can probably recognize a lot of what's going on. You can tell a lot of cool things about the data that's being presented. But if you're not familiar with that area, it's not as useful. Um, sometimes um, mapping can pose problems for us where we inherently get into problems where if we're doing something like uh, making a color, for the more people who live in a certain place. Like we're just always gonna have some problems because we have densely populated places that are always gonna be small. And we have really big rural areas that are always gonna kind of be overseen even though as many people don't live there. But just the way that geography works, we end up kind of underemphasizing where there are a lot of people and overemphasizing where there aren't very many. So. Um, the data this world has been trying some new ideas. Instead of a typical geographic map, we do equal sizes for different regions. So you might have a tile map where each region is the square of the same size and shape so that everybody can equally see. Or a hex map where each region is a hexagon, same size and shape so that everybody can be equally seen. So I think that stuff can help. Um, I have seen some mapping recently that uh, it, that does like a cone. It's like a location. So I, I want to say it was probably something like, no, oh, let's say COVID cases in um, cities around the United States. And they'll have a cone coming up from that city. Higher the cone, the more COVID cases, um, which can be interesting. People at first glance really like it, but it always frustrates people like me because I live in a small town and from the vantage point that we see in these maps, Chicago's big cone is always going to hide my city. So that's why I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I know mapping is very popular, um, but I don't know that it it does exactly what we want, where other graph types might help us tell a different story, even if it's geography data, doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean it has to be in a map. Okay. Well, this ties in perfectly with a question that one participant asked, and that is, are there steps or guidelines or general rules to follow to determine what kind of chart to use to visualize, visualize data? Yes, so um, that is gonna be what you find in my books. So the, <laughs> open, the opening cover of my book has a chart user in it that helps you figure out um, of all the charts, charts that are out there, which ones are gonna best align with the story that you have to tell. And I think that's, 
that's your first point, right? After you figured out your insight and the audience you're talking to, you need to start thinking through, okay, what's the basic nature of my data? Are we talking about change over time? That's gonna suggest certain graph types. Are we talking about parts of a whole? Well, if we are, the graph types we use for change over time probably aren't gonna be appropriate for parts of a whole. So you kind of have to have some understanding of the nature of your data, which is another reason why you need to spend enough time knowing your data before you can get started visualizing it. Okay, great, great. That was a brilliant answer. I hope it addresses what the, the person who asked it was um, trying to know, right? Um, so get Stephanie's book. <laughs> You'll get more details in there. Okay, so a more specific question now. One person wants to know if you can generate age groups in Excel. For example, his or her project requires um, him or her to present data in USAID age segregations. Well, so your data, in, no matter what software you use, your data is your data. Like your shape of your data is going to be I don't know how to say this correctly. You decide your age groups. Nobody mm -hmm. else is going to dictate those for you. You pick them. I mean, maybe you're using some kind of statistical software to, to do your age grouping. That's fine. Um, you do that in your statistical software, and then you bring it over into your graphing software. So whatever your age groups you decided to make, Excel, Tableau, R, anybody's going to handle them. But you're in charge of what those age groups would be. OK, great. Next question. I'm trying to get as much in. Another person asked, um, could you please describe the difference between data visualization, infographics, and data storytelling, or are they all the same thing? Yeah, that's a really good question. So data visualization, as we said at the beginning, is sort of this very large umbrella of any kind of graphical representation that's made from some kind of data, quantitative or qualitative, doesn't matter. So it's a really big umbrella that can be applied in lots of different ways. Data storytelling is is not very clearly defined at all. I think that's actually more of a marketing term than it is an actual like thing. Um, but for me, in my world, data storytelling is the act of you choosing the right message that goes with the right chart for the right audience. Like those things all together are part of our data storytelling. Sometimes it's story, data storytelling is how you pair multiple messages and charts together in a sequence if you have a, a bigger story that you have to tell. Um, but I think infographics are more defined as like those one pagers that are graphic heavy that mm -hmm. um, are trying to, they're, they're probably, they usually are going to have multiple graphics and multiple chunks of narrative in one space. Um, but infographics also, I, I see a very broad spectrum. You know, I, I started a Google alert on infographics back in like 2009 when I first saw this term like come up. You know, Google alerts will like send you an email every day of anything that's on the internet that has this word. Cause I thought this was a trend that was gonna die. The first ones that came out, I was like, oh, these are so cheesy. There's no way this is gonna last. Well, I was very wrong about that assumption because I still get that email from Google every single day. And the things that people call infographics range from a single chart, a single chart qualifies as an infographic, all the way to long, long, long scrolly telling uh, pieces that are made by very skilled graphic designers. I mean, I see it just so broadly. I see it, I see it used to talk about mostly a report that just has some graphs in it, but it's on one page, you know, so I think that the range of infographics is really big. Um, but I guess you could say infographics typically contain several data visualizations, if that helps clarify the distinction between those things at all. Okay, so you thought infographics were kind of corny and cheesy at first? <laughs> no, of course. I mean, they just get done so poorly, you know? And I think the reason that it bothers me, I think, is that a lot of traditional graphic designers who are making these things don't get training in data. I mean, any graphic design curriculum you see at any higher ed institution does not include a class on data. So they, they tend to do their best, but not always do the data justice. And so we end up with stuff that's got like, you know, cheesy clip art or something like that. <laughs> Maybe not quite doing it as well as it could. That's good. Okay, all right. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. So another question that uh, someone asked was, can you share some major do's and don'ts in data visualization that are like very key for beginners? 
Um, I'm trying to think of something different than what we've already said in terms of those mm -hmm. mistakes to avoid and those basic steps to get started. Um, do's and don'ts. Yeah. For example, what about people um, who are colorblind? I don't know. I'm hmm. just trying to brainstorm. Yeah. Like for me, I didn't even consider that. Mm, like, yeah, not everybody might be able to distinguish certain colors. So to be mindful of that in my charts, I don't know if you have any other tips. And how, how, how do you rectify that, by the way, Stephanie, come to think of it? Yeah. So, I mean, we'll just take colorblindness. I mean, that's an entire mm. conversation in and of itself. But so colorblindness affects about 8% of white European men. It affects about 6% of Japanese men. And it's not as prevalent in any other group. But depending on where you are, you're required to design with colorblindness in mind. In the United States, it's a requirement here. Um, so that the main form of color blindness is going to be on the red green spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if you were trying to be colorblind friendly, you would not use red and green together in the same chart to someone who's colorblind. It looks like like two very similar shades of like a muddy greenish brown. It's very hard to distinguish between those two colors. So um, you would avoid using red and green in the same chart. You would especially avoid using red to mean bad and green to mean good, which is a very, very common thing I still see all the time. Um, but that means people who are colorblind really don't know if you're talking about the best or the worst. Like those things look exactly the same to them. So you'd want to avoid using that particular color combination. Yellow blue is another one that can be tough for some people, but it's not nearly as prevalent as the red green color blindness is. So it would just mean don't use those things together. Right. So in, if you wanted to say good and bad, you would just use other colors that could also mean good and bad. Like instead of good being green, maybe you're going to use blue or a purple or whatever feels culturally appropriate to you. Instead of red being bad, maybe use like an orange, you know? I mean, I just think we have to pick just different combinations. Okay, it's very interesting you spoke about cultural considerations um, because, and red as maybe being bad and green as good. Are there any other cultural considerations from your own personal experience? You've been doing this a while that you could share with us, like to be careful of how we use it well, I think color in general is mm -hmm. something that is some, something that we're going to have to navigate culturally speaking, because everybody, everybody is a meaning maker. Everybody walks around making meaning out of things, even if you don't want them to be making meaning out of things, they will. So color is especially one of the things that people see and they start associating thoughts, feelings, emotions with particular colors and cultures tend to share those same associations. It's not. Um, it's not going to be 100%, but you tend to see some common some common themes come up in different cultures. So you just kind of need to know what you're thinking when you use that color and what other people are going to be thinking when they use that color. And context matters so much. I mean, in the business context, um, a lot of people will say red means bad or error, warning, something like that. But to my indigenous friends, outside of their business context, red means courage and strength. Um, so I mean, I think a lot of people code switch, and so they might have some feelings and associations outside of work versus inside of work. But I just think we need to be really mindful of it. If you take red to China, you're going to end up getting very different associations than the, the bad warning error that we might be thinking in certain business contexts. So that's something to always keep in mind. But culture really influences a lot about how we visualize. I mean, the more we think about it, and I think a lot of people don't the more that we pay attention to who our audience is, um, the better we're gonna be at how we frame that story. Yeah, it goes back to what you said earlier. You have to know your audience mm -hmm. so that you know exactly the considerations, how to pitch it, and um, mm -hmm. maybe what could offend or how to best connect with that audience. Okay, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. great point. Uh, another question came in and it's, if you could say a little bit more about your approach to data visualization, if it is different for a report that is submitted digitally versus one that will be printed and read by the client? Um, so for print versus uh, digital, I don't really have many differences. I mean, I think the one difference could be whether your audience is expecting it to be interactive. And often if you're like embedding it in a website, then people might be thinking that there's some interactivity involved. Um, I don't always default to that. I don't necessarily think people want to interact. I think that 
data viz designers thought people wanted to interact and so we built in all these like bells and whistles and cool things that you could do and then when you look at user feedback and when you look at track click uh, tracking clicks people aren't interacting they just want to see a static visualization that tells them the story without having to dig for it so i default to static whichever software i'm using to make it i'll default to static and so then you really wouldn't see a difference between something that's going to be digital versus something that's going to be printed i mean there are minor things like the quality of your jpeg file you know little things like that but nothing really about how you're designing it in the first place okay all right thank you and with that that segues into the next question which is do you know of any useful checklists or tools to ensure that we can make visuals as accessible as possible? I so a couple, mm -hmm. Sure, so a couple of ways that we can answer this. So I have a data visualization checklist on my website that's totally free. You upload a picture of your graph and we'll walk you through the checkpoints that help you make sure your story is really, really clear. It's really a, about your formatting, um, to, to help you ensure that your, your text is smart, your colors are smart, you've stripped out unnecessary clutter and things like that. Any place where you don't score well, we give you, we point you to some free resources on my blog that help you get better at that. But that one does not specifically address 508 compliance. There are some checkpoints in there on say color blindness. And when you get to that checkpoint, we'll actually show you what your graph looks like to someone who has red, green color blindness and yellow, blue color blindness so that you can make sure the colors are gonna work. Um, but if you wanted to dive more directly into accessibility, there are so many checklists that are out there. One of my favorite ones to use, I'm gonna type this into the um, chat box, is WebAIM, this website, WebAIM. Um, they have a color contrast checker in there, but they also do a lot of just general like 508 compliance um, checking for you. And they have some checkpoints that you could mark yourself against. Okay, Sally asked the question and Sally says, fabulous, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this compliance that you're speaking about for uneducated people like me, when I say yeah, uneducated, yeah. to database, <laughs> what exactly? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a United States thing, so don't feel like you should know about it. Um, but mm -hmm. in the United States, we have what we would say is 508 compliance. It's a law that was passed as part of the Americans with Disabilities Act that says things you post publicly have to be accessible to anybody with any disability. So that means people who are low vision, who are using screen readers still need to be able to see your visual. People who have disabilities like color blindness still need to be able to see your visual. So um, things that we have to think about in order to make sure that our, our work is, is being compliant. So I don't know if there's an equivalent of that in many other countries, but if you do work in the United States, it tends to be at the forefront of your mind. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I learned something. Well, more yeah. than one thing today. Thank you. And Joe was so nice enough to put the link to your data visualization checklist. Thanks, Joe. Maybe now is a good time to let people know where they can find you about your academy. That that good stuff. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, my website is stephanieevergreen.com. That's how I already saw that question come up. And from there, you're gonna get to lots of different places. You'll see a tab in there for what is in them and how to order them, whether on Amazon, but um, still the link will be there. Um, and the, the link to the blog is on there where there are free tips. Today, I posted a blog on what to do if COVID interrupted your data collection, how you should, how you can handle, ways you could handle it if, um, your data collection got cut off back in March somehow. So there's always going to be free tips on there. Um, but the, the Data Viz Academy is another great place to go for instruction in this stuff because it is my online workshop. So we teach you how to use Excel, Tableau, and R to build better data visualizations. We tell you how to think about it. You get the chart chooser in there that helps you figure out what your best chart type is going to be. And so we give you like the approach to data visualization in there. And then we show you step by step how to actually make it. There are over 60 tutorials in Excel and in Tableau and in R um, that take you all the way from how to make a very basic bar chart and change those defaults and all the way to like making interactive dashboards and kind of everything in between. So no matter where you are with your skills, you can grow you more. Okay, so th that is Stephanie's way. This this is two persons listening of saying, and you need to sign up for my 
academy you need it <laughs> to learn how to change defaults. <laughs> okay, all right. So as one person wants to know if, if there are any more tips on qualitative data visualization, how to, to do that. Well, yes. Um, so I would say that the, the basic things I see are just quotes. Right. So like yeah. usually and this is what I was doing back when I was uh, just researching and evaluating full time and we did a lot of qualitative work and we would just throw a whole string of quotes together It'd be like 10 quotes. And that's incredibly challenging for people to read and digest and process later. You know, I always feel like quotes are the raw data. They're the same thing as a spreadsheet of numbers. We need to actually do something with that data instead of just giving people a table and wishing them the best of luck, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the next step people take tends to be word clouds. That tends to be there like, okay, I know quotes aren't enough, so what, what should I do? Um, and they go to word clouds, but those also kind of lack some of the depth and meaning that we really want when we're thinking about qualitative visualization. So. I mean, easy, easy things that you can do. If you're going to put a quote in there, put a picture. People want to see, we're driven to look at visuals. So give us the visual, give us the, the face of the person who is saying these words. Sometimes I know you've got confidentiality and you can't do that. Sometimes I think a stock photo could be reasonable enough of a substitution. I also think it's helpful if we compare the quote near quantitative data that it's connected to. Um, back in my day, when I was doing research and evaluation full time, we would have two teams, the qual team and the quant team, never the two shall meet. And so the report was equally divided. You'd have a quant section and a qual section. You could be talking about the same things in the two different sections, but we put the, the burden on the audience to like figure out what we mean about this topic by pairing together the information in two different parts of the report. It's ridiculous. So I think it's on us to pair those things together where they belong. So putting the quotes near the graphs that they're that they're talking about can be another way to help. But but beyond that, I mean, I think we've pulled together 20 different ways to visualize qualitative data, like in charts, like really cool stuff. Um, there's a, a collection of my, I've written about all this stuff in my blog. And so there's a collection in the blog for qualitative data where you can see at least some of these examples. More are in the books, but there's a good starting point there. I love it when you said quant and qualitative and the two shall never meet. So there you go, guys. <laughs> Use the images. <laughs> Not just That's code. exactly right. That is right. Okay, great. And so what are your thoughts on using video as a part of data visualization? Because that question came up a few times in the chat. Sure. I mean, I think video <laughs> is cool. I'm not sure. I mean, video can be a great way, especially for qualitative data, to help people tell stories. That, that and when we say we want to see a, the face behind the person speaking, video can be a great way to do that. Um, I always feel like the trick with video is attention span. I mean, like our videos really can't be very long or people kind of lose their ability to stay focused. Uh, so I think we have to just do some smart editing with that. And um, but I I mean, I've seen it work really well. Sure. Even even basic like animations uh, that that get themselves toward being a video um, can be effective. So, yeah, go for okay. it. Just edit well. Yeah, go for it. And as uh, like with the infographics, <laughs> just <laughs> make quality ones, right? Okay. Right. That's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what do you recommend someone ask to 3D or 2D graphs and pie charts? What's your preference and why? Oh, we should really only be using 2D charts. There's no reason to be using 3D at any point in time. We've seen lots of examples and research about how 3D distorts our ability to accurately read the chart. So just no 3D at any time for any reason. Um, that just will never work. Uh, so 2D would be the way to go. Um, in terms of pie charts, I mean, I always feel like pie charts are going to be fine if you could take off the percentages and the story would still be pretty clear. That's kind of your, your clue that your pie chart's going to be fine. That's going to inherently mean you don't have that many wedges in your pie or else the story would get murky. Um, but if you can take off the percentages and you can still generally see what the story is, go for it. Okay. So if I was having a pie 
that was divided to feed too many people. That means there are too many slices <laughs> in the pie. Then I maybe should not have been using a pie chart. Right. You would just ah. want to switch it out. Something like a bar chart would be a better option. You can always take that further and make a lollipop graph or a dot plot or something like that. But the basic switch from a pie to a bar, just that first step is going to take you far. Okay. So there you go, guys. A rule of thumb mm -hmm. is if your pie chart cannot fully satisfy, if the slices cannot fully satisfy <laughs> someone, <laughs> if one person is going to get a thin piece of slice and it cannot be shared, don't use the pie chart. More there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, we'll slide in one question before we have a practical exercise, guys. I'll be sharing the screen and Stephanie will be giving her thoughts on what I put up, right? So mm -hmm. this last question, what's a good balance of visuals to have in a report? How do you pick which data to present with a visual? Okay, so that's, that's really two different questions. How do you pick which data to uh, pair with a visual? Well, you're gonna start with your insight, right? You're gonna have spent your time looking at your data. You're gonna go, you're, you might even try a couple different chart types just while you're exploring your data to see what patterns emerge for you, what outliers pop up for you. You're gonna use that to generate your insight. And then your insight is going to dictate what your ultimate final chart form would be. So how much data do you need? You need enough that supplies the evidence to support your insight. That's usually gonna mean some kind of comparison or a benchmark or some historical data points, enough that the evidence that supports your claim is gonna be clear. Um, the second question was, how do you know how many to have in a report? Um, I mean, it's incredibly hard to answer that question. You could have, I've seen very effective reports that have six graphs per page, that have 12 graphs per page. It all depends on how clean and organized it is. Um, and just at the other end of that spectrum being one messy graph is too many graphs on a page, right? So if your graphs are tidy and clean, if you've stripped out a lot of that clutter, then you can have many graphs on one page and it won't feel overwhelming. Because we touched on this earlier, person were asking, is there the checklist for knowing what is good data visualization? How do mm -hmm. I know whether to use a, by, a, a pie chart or a bar a line graph or and i think the common theme i'm now picking up is basically if to, to tips is just to keep it clean and lean and if you can strip the labelings if it would still make sense mm -hmm. clean that, and lean i like it yeah clean and lean okay all mm -hmm. right great mm -hmm. with that <laughs> said i'm now going to share my screen guys and um it's not from Stephanie, it's just something I whipped together to get Stephanie's thoughts on and your thoughts as well as we look on the screen because we have discussed so much about bad data visualization and what is a good data visualization. So let's get some practical examples. So here we go. All right. Are you able to see Stephanie? Mm hmm Okay. All right. This should have been the first. Okay. So. I just picked this up randomly from the internet. Okay. All these visualizations were using the same data set. So mm -hmm. the the what would be the right term for the circles? Because it's not a, pie a chart. bubble chart. Bubble, a bubble chart. Okay. And then the one with the gray lines, that would be a line graph. A bar. A bar, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, I know a pie chart, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Okay, so let's just spend a little moment to, to look at them. I already, based on what Stephanie taught me, I already know that this pie chart maybe has too many slices. But anyhow, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so let's try now. So the question that I have was looking at each visualization, would you be able to answer the following questions? What, where are the most expensive taxes? Where are the, the cheapest? Where are the taxi costs about the same? And is there France somewhere in the chart? So I'll just mm. stop talking and I, you guys reflect on these questions. And then 
maybe Stephanie can take us through her thoughts based on the questions and what she think of the data and which visualization best captured the answers for these questions. So. So. Stephanie, mm -hmm. of these four visualizations, which you would you say is the best based on the questions we want answered? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the bar charts are going to be the best here. Uh, from the research that we've seen about how people read chart forms, uh, the volume, meaning the size, sorry, I wanted to say area, meaning the size of the bubble is very hard for people to, to accurately gauge. Um, the angle is only slightly better in the pie chart. It's only slightly easier for people to accurately read than the bubbles are. And the bar charts uh, using length to encode the data is going to be the best of these three here. Um, so I think that the bar charts are going to be the best. They're also like the order of the bar chart is also part of what's really important here. It's that they're ordered greatest to least. So they set you up very well to answer questions like what's the most expensive, what's the least expensive, because it's put you in that order already. Um, so, you know, the pie and the bubble not being in that order are going to make it a, a much harder for you to just quickly assess those key answers, which are going to be those common questions that people have. So we've got the two bar charts on here. And, um, you know, I see people in the chat box saying that the gray chart is better. Um, some people saying that they like the blue better. But um, I think it's difficult for both of them have drawbacks that and things that I wouldn't necessarily love. Like in the blue one, it is running greatest to least, but it has some extra stuff in here that we don't necessarily need. And I lost Anne, so I want to make sure that she's back. Oh, there she is. OK. So the one at the bottom, it just has some of that extra clutter. When we talk about lean and clean, it's got some unnecessary clutter in there. Like, we already have the dollar amounts at the end of every single bar. So we wouldn't need to have the x-axis across the bottom. We don't need to have an x-axis title that says cost in dollars. You already know that in the title of the chart itself. We don't need to have the grid lines coming up from the x axis. Like, the, it's just a lot of unnecessary clutter. We don't need to have country listed at the top of the countries. Like, this is stuff we already know. It's quite evident by looking at the chart elsewise. So, we don't need to have that extra stuff. It's kind of cluttering it up more than it needs to. So, a lot of people are going to go to the gray bar because of those drawbacks. But for me, I feel like black text on a gray background is a little hard to read, actually. So I don't love that fact. And in gray, when we think about color, it's an it's often used as a way to diminish some things. It's gray can be used as a way to put some things in the background, whereas like bright colors are gonna make things kind of pop out at you. Gray is sort of how we fade things out into the background. So it looks like everything's kind of background here. And I don't necessarily love that. I'd like to see a color on here. I don't mind the flags, but I don't know that they really help that much. And this might just be me being a very bad American, but I can't tell what countries are by their flag except for my own. I'm sorry. It's I know it's bad, but it's true. So the flags don't really help me in this case. It feels like unnecessary decoration for me. But for other people, that might be something that's really great. I don't hear you anymore, Can you hear Anne? me? I was, I was just said, okay, <laughs> I get you. All right. So, um, so I think you might be muted. Okay. Can Can you hear me? Mm -mm. Can Can you see me? Can you see me? Oh, you can hear Anne. Okay. Then it must okay. Be me. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> oh. Okay. Are you Are you hearing me now, Stephanie? Know what happened all right we're hearing you though oh 
get out. All right, great. I was just saying that we're hearing you. And worst case, I would type and just say, all I needed to do is just to criticize this graph. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Just criticize this one now. <laughs> okay. So, but, but, but from before, I'm already learning, as we say, lean, lean and clean is better. So as much as possible, mm -hmm. if we can do without labels, so like when you say country, let me go back. So for example, the dollar signs are already there. So I maybe don't necessarily need to again put the dollar sign and also to maybe put the flags in there again. So is that what data, good data visualization is as much as possible to declutter? I think decluttering is a really big piece mm -hmm. of it, right? So, so in the data viz world, there's this principle called signal versus noise. And noise is going to be all that extra clutter that's making it hard for people to see the thing that you're there to show them. So our job is to is to do whatever we can to boost the signal and to decrease the noise that can clutter things up and make it difficult for us to see what's going on in here. So um, yeah, signal versus noise is going to be a really important visual um, for people, a really important principle for people to think about. The next slide. And do you want me to just talk about these? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, because maybe there are why I see incorrect and I see correct. And I think I know why the one on the left is incorrect. But if you could just take us through the reasons why the pie on the right is a better option. I mean, I'm not really sure why the this person said the pie on the right is a better option, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know that the I don't know that the shades of one color are actually helpful here. I think that for some people who have low vision, there's not enough distinction between those shades in order for them to be able to see the differences. Uh, whereas different colors could be a little bit easier for people. But honestly, I would say no to both of these and turn this into a bar chart. I think it would be much easier to read as a bar chart than as a pie chart, no matter what. So, um, and when you have a bar chart, your data regions aren't going to be touching each other. So you don't have to worry about the situation of do we have four totally different colors or four shades of one color. It's not even a point you have to contend with if it's a bar chart because the bars won't be touching. They could all be one color like we just saw in that last graph or they could be different colors. It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, I just think it'll be easier to read. So I'm going to say notable. Okay. All right. And for my bar chart, pie charts, is it because you mentioned for the bars they're not touching so you can use different colors but what is the rule of thumb for pie charts if the data is correct and suits a pie chart do i stick to one color and then different gradations or i can use multi colors in the pie chart what's the rule of thumb i think it's going to depend on the nature of your data so some people would use shades of a color if the the things you're graphing are sequential in nature, like excellent to awful, right? That might be, um, uh, that's a sequence. So using a sequential set of colors, like shades of one color might make sense. But you'll notice here that they didn't even use the sequence in the right sequence, like awful, I don't know, I'm not explaining this very well, but excellent and awful are the opposites with average and mediocre in between. So the, the shades of color here aren't even matching the sequence. So that's why I'm just saying no to all of this. So for sequential data, a sequential color scheme could make sense. But if you're talking about categorical data, I would actually say all just one color, unless you are trying to pop something out. Mm -hmm. So your, all of your pie wedges might be in gray with like a white border between them so that you can distinguish them except for one that you're trying to tell a story about. Like if you're trying to talk about how you had 15% that were awful and you're at the staff meeting going, oh my gosh, we need to do something about this 15% that said awful. You need to pop that 15% wedge out of your pie in some kind of action color so that people aren't struggling to go, okay, where is that? Where is that? Their eyes will just jump to it. So I prefer all one color okay. and um, then one action color to pop something okay. out. Okay, all right, fair enough, thank you. Let's go on to the next. Yeah, <laughs> based on everything you said, I think this one is pretty straightforward. What's wrong? 
Yeah, so you do this one. Oh, okay. See, see what the teacher does. All right, let me see if I learned anything, <laughs> teacher Stephanie. <laughs> okay, so the one on the left is not ordered correctly, so it, it, it's too much work for me to decide. It's, it's not in order, it's not. Mm -hmm. So I prefer the one on the right. I, well, maybe because it already has the labeling in the chart itself, I would remove the labeling from the access below. So like the 45%, 30%, I would keep it in the chart, but remove it from below. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I necessarily need a different, different colors here because it's clear by the length of the bar, which was excellent. So anyway, that, that is just my, um, how I would improve this. <laughs> yeah. I think that's great. Yeah, and I would remove the grid lines. You won't need the grid lines if you take out the X axis. So I think that that would be fine. Um, what else is I going to say? Oh, you always have a choice too about whether your labels are going to go outside to the end of the bar like they are here or inside the end of the bar. Sometimes putting them in the end of the bar and then giving them a contrasting color like white or something um, can just keep people's attention more focused on the bar itself instead of looking at the bar, looking at the number, looking at the bar, looking at the number. So if you superimpose those things, sometimes that can help. You could even go one step further and take out the black, the, the vertical black um, axis line there. Uh, that's just unnecessary. You know, we just could have excellent right next to the excellent bar and that would be totally sufficient. Okay. Well, thank you. And for the last slide, which I know is bad data visualization, too much information, <laughs> too much clutter. <laughs> I know, but this slide is useful for persons who are asking, is there a checklist to know which data should be presented? How? So this gives you an example. I don't expect you to read it now. It's bad data visualization to have it crammed like this on one page while you're trying to listen to me <laughs> at the same time. But I will share a copy of this for you to go through in your own quiet time to go through. I see we're right up to the final minutes of this webinar. And I just want to maybe get in one or two quick questions from persons before I close. Oh, someone wanted to know if he or she wants to become a freelancer in data storytelling. What what's some recommendations to do so to break into the industry? Well, I think the best thing you could possibly do is have examples of your work. I mean, you need to you need to show people where you can take folks. So maybe show the befores and afters of some of your side projects or some of your client projects, you need to put those in a portfolio on your website or use social media to share those examples. But that's going to be the best evidence of your work. You just need to make great data viz and get it out okay. there. Great. And another question is for someone who they have to work with graphic designers, would you recommend that they prepare a briefing before with the specialist and how can the person then become better at translating what is in their mind is yeah it's a very heavy question but just to translate that to us yeah sure so i always feel like uh designers love if we can come at least with a sketch of what we're looking mm -hmm. for so if you can at least and that's why i made the sketchbook if you can at least sketch out your thoughts and tell them your insight tell them your point then they're going to be able to take that and run with it Sometimes graphic designers can also be a good partner to help you word your point well. Sometimes if we're too deep into our work, we we can we get very technical with our language and um, a graphic designer could even help us think of wording that would be more suitable for particular audiences. But if we tell them the insight we're trying to convey and the basic chart type that we're thinking of, then um, I think they can take it from there. But my favorite workshops are where I have the graphic design team and the data people in the same room at the same time, learning the same graph types, getting on the same page with each other. There are so many more graph types than the six that we see here. This is a good start. But there are so, so, so many more out there. And the more that we do that training together, the more everybody's on the same page talk in the same language and then we, we pull down some of these barriers okay great maybe i can squeeze in one last question and is it how do you highlight to deal with colors when the data is disaggregated by many variables such as gender age group locations Mm -hmm. So I would say um, your best bet there is probably to use your branding colors. I mean, I always still feel like you have an obligation to tell a story. So I, we don't want to just be showing 
gender data, we want to be telling a story like there are equal men and women here, or there are more women than we expected to who enrolled in our study. And then you're going to probably use some kind of action color to highlight whatever that piece in your in your graph that you're talking about. Um, but I think the the worst thing we can do is use stereotypical colors. So blue for boys, pink for girls. You want to be very careful when you're using color around racial groups um, because people, you know, will connect that to certain feelings. I've certainly seen examples here in the United States where um, black people were visualized with red and they interpreted that to mean that they were bad. And I, I mean, we, re we really want to be thoughtful about this stuff. So avoid all the stereotypes and stick with your brand colors, if nothing else, and you should okay. be fine. All right. Well, thank you so very much, Stephanie. I learned a lot. Thank I you. learned a lot. I know indeed everyone else did. And I see the comments coming through, people thanking you for this excellent presentation. Thank you so much. The recording will be sent to you guys and available. And thank you more than anything for your time. All right. And you know where to find yeah, thank Stephanie. You, so to everyone, have a good day wherever in the world you are. Take care until next time. Bye bye.